Tonight on 48 Hours. It was once a police state. But now the police aren't always in control. Law and disorder in the USSR. The money has passed. Take them. Take them. We have a murder case. Very interesting. And a strange, strange one. The demand is growing. Drugs. And there's nothing that can be done about it. Alcohol. Many of our, our crimes are committed while people are under the influence of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Juvenile crime. First you're a victim and then you become a criminal. Organized crime. <laughs> Moscow Vice. Good evening. We're live in Washington, D.C. President Bush is entertaining Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev at a formal state dinner. While the presidents are whining and dining at the summit, we're going to visit the lower depths of the country Gorbachev left behind. For example, you will see and hear organized crime in Moscow, the new Russian mob. As the Kremlin loosens its grip on its people, the cop on the beat has his hands full. Crime was up 40 percent just last year. 48 hours journeyed to the dark side of the new Russian Revolution, from the streets to the precinct house, covering Moscow Vice. Moscow in the spring. As hardline communism continues to thaw, a new order is emerging here. But for now, no one knows the rules. Private businesses and cooperatives are flourishing, choice targets for the vanguard in Soviet crime, organized crime. A back street in Moscow. A Soviet businessman, threatened by extortionists, keeps his appointment with the local hood. They wanted 5,000 rubles? Yes, they wanted to take my money. They said I would be protected if I gave them money. They said they'd break my legs. But in this deal, the police are watching. Making the arrest? Police officers from a Moscow unit specializing in organized crime. Commanding officer on the scene? Alexander Komarov. This type of crime is getting worse because now criminals can focus on people who are making large sums of money in cooperatives. Because of this money, their circle is expanding and allowing them to hire the young strongmen as enforcers. And this is Arnold. You like him? Yes, of course. I very like this bodybuilder. Nick has the power to enforce his own law. He's the leader of a Moscow street gang. Nicholas, why do you have to stay strong? Why do you stay strong? Because if I don't stay strong, I won't be able to survive the competition. I protect businessmen. That's how I live. Legitimate businesses are not the only prey of Moscow's racketeers. 
when state-run liquor stores close, black marketeers take up the slack, selling booze at inflated prices and paying street gangs for protection. <laughs> I don't have to beat their face in. If someone doesn't want to pay, we just take his vodka and smash the bottles. Nothing criminal in that. Nick and his boys are one of many gangs fighting to control turf. <laughs> Today, they're setting off to meet a rival gang, competition trying to muscle in. They wanted to take our daily bread. They came and started to demand money from the people that nourish us. We told them that we would destroy them if they tried to do that again. <laughs> Socialism? You mean the kind we have here? I hate it. Where are the things that they promised us at the beginning? We were promised that it was all for the people. Where is it? I don't understand. I can't help about shit shape I'm in. I can't sing, I ain't pretty, but my legs are thin. But don't ask who I think of you. I'm not even answer that you want me to. Yes, our boys won today, and we can continue to make money like we did before. On the front lines in the battle against organized crime, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Komarov, a group leader in a special 102-man force. In today's operation, Alexander's unit is hoping to catch bigger fish, what the Soviets loosely call their own mafia. Their target? Members of an ethnic group called the Chechens the most brutal gang in Moscow. It's another sting. The victim is a middleman in a black market deal gone bad. Now, the Chechen Mafia wants him to pay up 6,000 rubles in a country where most people make only 200 a month. After you give him the money, put the newspaper in your jacket. Then we'll move in. Across the street from the rendezvous, the police set up their observation post and wait for the deal to go down. At one o'clock sharp, all the players make their entrance. The victim is talking to the other guy. They're discussing the deal now. As soon as the money has passed, we'll take them. The money has passed. Take them. Take them. The three people in the sting contacted these people in the car, so we detained them as well. They, they say that some people belong to the mafia here. Do you know anything about that? No, no. No mafia. No mafia. No mafia. You had your rackets before, like in the 1930s. Al Capone. Al Capone. This will pass. Except for the three men caught in the sting, by afternoon's end, the other detainees are released. Nothing tied them directly to the crime. <laughs> this man's parting shot? Mafia <laughs> the mafia is forever. <laughs> the United States has been criticized for many years um, as a, being a society that has corruption and crime. And do you find it ironic that now these things are happening here in this socialist society. In terms of crime, I never differentiated between capitalism and socialism. We all live on the same planet with the same contradictions. What is happening in our country is not because of socialism, it's because of human nature. Ever since Gorbachev began lifting the Iron Curtain, all sorts of light has been flooding into the Soviet Union. In Moscow these days, kids can watch music videos beamed in by satellite from what the old men in the Kremlin used to call the decadent West. But there's also a darkness amidst the light. It's called juvenile crime. Three young muggers running away from a Moscow train station. 
two undercover cops from the juvenile crime unit in pursuit. A 21-year-old man named Yuri has just been robbed. It's his first time in Moscow. And what they take? They stole 20 rubles and uh, his, his ticket home. 20 rubles, all the money he had, about $3. So what do you do now? I don't even know what I can do. I, I'm going to have to go back to the train station and spend the night there. Yuri is two days away from home by train with no way to get there. And while crime is not nearly as bad here as in most big American cities, it is getting worse. The undercover juvenile crime cops, Igor Korolov and Yevgeny Gordin, they'll take kids in for just looking like they don't belong here. We have a problem with um, kids who come from out of town because of the economic problems of this country. Kids come in to Moscow to get clothes, food, and so on because they can't get it where they live. How long under Soviet law are you allowed to keep these kids here uh, without charging them with a crime? Three hours. Three hours. It's past midnight in Moscow, and back at the train station, the undercover cops are approached by a bootlegger. He's offering me wine for black market price. And he won't back off just because of our camera. He obviously doesn't know you're a policeman. No, he doesn't know, of course. You know, selling wine is illegal. If the cops ever found out, they could arrest you. He says he's never been arrested for that, but he's not worried about it happening. You're not worried about it. Why do you do it? It's against the law. Every man for himself. Business. It's a business. Okay, good luck. You're going to need it. It's a clear-cut case, <laughs> but they let him go. Did you feel sorry for him? I feel sorry for him. He's just 21 years old. He's young, and he's already gone. I mean that it's sad, you know because uh, life is changing. Vera Kripanova and her 14-year-old daughter Elizabeth, among Moscow's elite, they see the changes and notice the darkness. And lots of people steal because they think, they feel that it will be worse in the future. So this is the time, the good time for stealing. It's not only for children, Hello. it's a mentality. Why are you here in jail? We have stolen sneakers. Sneakers? Sneakers? It's one of the new hot juvenile crimes in the Soviet Union, sneaker snatching. He traveled 900 miles to steal a pair. Now let me make sure I understand this, Alec. You got on a train someplace up the Volga River, traveled a day and a half to Moscow to steal somebody's sneakers? Uh, <laughs> Why sneakers? Mod. Just fashion. Fashion. Just look at our kids. I, I go to school and I see that <clears throat> they, you know, they don't believe in anything really. Skeptical. Uh, yeah, they're very skeptical. The wild ones, Moscow style, wheelies in the night. Police call them the rockers. They live in the shadows of the new Soviet Union, part of it, but mostly apart from it. Do you have any dreams? What do kids want to be? What do, what do you hope for in this, in this new Soviet Union? That's a very interesting question. The thing is that I don't think our generation has anything to dream about. Who do you look up to? Do you have any heroes? No, we don't have any heroes, no idols. Have any of you, honest, been either the victims of crime or have actually committed crimes yourself? 
Жертвы это начиная с самого рождения. Мы да. были victims since we were born. The thing is, you first you're a victim and then you become a criminal. And at the train station, Yuri can't do very much but sit and wait and hope he finds a way home sometime soon. In just a few hours, it will be light outside, and the lighter it gets these days in the Soviet Union, the easier it is to see the darkness. It's a typical night in Leningrad, with its typical nightmares, pleasures, sorrows and joys. Where are we going, Alexander? To the cemetery. Each night, crime reporter Alexander Nevzorov is searching for the underside of life in Leningrad. What's in here? A place where scoundrels hide their illegal profits. His nightly investigative program, 600 Seconds, the money is here, is the most popular show on Soviet television. All the graves are full of pocket change. Our state is built on crime. It's normal life here. To be a criminal is normal. His reports have already forced the head of the Communist Party in Leningrad to resign. Why do you think your program is so popular? Because we hate the Bolshevism, the communism. This is the only reason. I don't like communism. I hate them. Why do the communists let you on the air then? Why did they let you on the air to criticize them? They are weak now. They don't have enough power to stop us. Where are we going? We have a murder case. Very interesting. And a strange, strange one. But the TV set is still on in the flat. The murder has just been committed. There is blood everywhere. The murder victim owned one of the new private businesses in the Soviet Union. He was shot on his head. First they had a fight. Nevzorov suspects a mob extortion connection. The man was out of control. Everything is broken in the flat. Why include a gruesome murder on your television show? Our life is bloody. It's an event revealing the character of the city. We show it the way it is, how terrible it is. If we don't remind the public what a criminal society this is, it will be even worse. Let's go. Nevzorov was a stuntman in Russian movies before he came up with the idea for 600 seconds. At least for now, he is Glasnost's biggest star. Do authorities consider you a threat to them in some way because of your popularity? Yes, they do. They consider me a threat. And they are right. Has anyone ever threatened to hurt you? Yes. I'm alive. <laughs> Nothing happened to me still. No holes in me, no wounds. This is a knife. Another day, another story. He murdered a pregnant woman whom he stabbed with a knife. A convicted murderer is being sentenced. Many Americans would be surprised at the access that you have to this town. You seem to be able to open any door. I have official sources. I have connections in every militia prison. I have friends everywhere. So the sentence is 13 years in prison and in camp. It should be more severe. It's not enough severe. I would argue with the, with the judge. He knows all the circumstances. But uh, I hate the guy. If it's not a death penalty, uh, for me it's soft. 47 million people will watch Nevzorov tonight. A bigger audience than any news program in the U.S. <laughs> bigger than any show on American primetime television. Two years ago, three years ago, it was a sensation, but now it is not. We are tired of it. TV executive Sasha Sokolov reflects a growing concern that Nevzorov is getting hooked on the violence he records. All these black things, black sides of our life, it's, it's not very humane, in my opinion. It's not very humane. You just finished one show, are you getting ready for another? <laughs> the Soviet Empire is collapsing. It will happen. I feel I can contribute to the collapse of the Empire. People will see what's evil, what's bad.
A precinct in southwest Moscow. This night, like every night, these cops are on drunk patrol. Do you get hardened to this? I haven't become indifferent to their suffering. And I think about all of the sorrow that they bring their family members. It, it makes me very sad. 80% of the crime here is linked to alcohol abuse. Its effect may even be more devastating on Soviet society than drugs are in the United States. The lady there in the, in the, in the white jacket is a psychiatrist. She was a member of the group that I trained. Leo Kiley is an American with a unique perspective on the problem. Now she realizes that alcoholics are more sensitive, perhaps, than the ordinary person. He is a recovering alcoholic, and four years ago, he came to work at this Moscow hospital. And you're sort of expected, you know, if you're one of the boys, to continue drinking. It's bottoms up every time. Yeah, you drink it straight down, one shot, and no pausing in between. You're not a real man unless you drink, and you drink, you know, as fast and as much as everyone else. Kylie is responsible for bringing the techniques of Alcoholics Anonymous to the Soviet Union. At first, there was a lot of resistance. The social system of the Soviet yes, Union, groups of people getting together and sharing things at this level was probably considered pretty dangerous, possibly subversive. Probably five years ago, this would be unheard of or unthinkable. Despite some progress in treatment, government figures are not encouraging. Last year alone, the sale of alcohol increased 20%. The drug war, Moscow style. What's happening? What's happening? What are you doing to me? Narcotics officers seize two suspects they believe just purchased drugs at a nearby market. Police are convinced that they have a clean bust that will lead to the conviction of Oktai Asadov, believed to be a major drug trafficker situation with drugs here is probably similar to the situation in, uh, with drugs in the U.S., let's say, in the 50s or 60s, when yet it wasn't around all that much. Andre Donalenko is a 23-year-old American from San Francisco involved in Moscow's drug war. This program was designed to help the kids stay off the street. Stay away from drugs. And their life is so miserable, they consider that uh, taking drugs takes away the pain. This is Moscow's narcotic squad. 17 men for a city of 9 million people. Last year, they detained about 4,000. Only about 300 went to prison. My name is Valentin Chikolin. I've worked 23 years with the police, the last 12 in the fight against drugs. Chikolin says he hopes the cops are winning, but concedes the situation is serious. Today we're going to Chiriamushki Market, where people are suspected of buying and selling drugs. There could be some physical violence, but our guys are well prepared for these moments. If we don't find any drugs, we'll say, sorry, and let them go. And in this case, no drugs were found, and the suspects were eventually released. Drug convictions are harder to get because videotaped evidence cannot be used in courts. And civilians, not police, must be willing to testify they purchased drugs from dealers. The person who was sitting in the front seat of this car stepped on vials of liquid opium and broke them. So if the um, ampoule is broken, does that mean you can still use it as evidence? Yes. Oktai, the alleged drug dealer we saw earlier, is taken to the police station. A bag of dried opium is found in his pocket. He admits it's his, but Oktai claims he uses it only as a medicine. We always give our kids this dried opium. 
If I've got a stomach ache or my kids have a stomach ache, we just boil it up and drink it. I'm not a drug addict. I don't shoot up. I don't smoke it. Do you have any fresh marks? Huh? No, no. Look, you said you don't, but you do. How old is this? 24 hours? No, no, I swear. I got this a long time ago. Four days later, we found Octai back on the street. He says that uh, he was beaten up, kicked out of the station, let go, essentially. The police thought Octai had voluntarily gone to Narcological Hospital No. 17, Moscow's only drug treatment facility. But he didn't. What are they using? Mostly they're using opium, various amphetamines, uh, chemical mixtures, poppy seed. Officially, there are 8,000 registered drug addicts in Moscow. But everyone concedes that that number is much too low. I spent all of it on drugs. <laughs> You're Americans and you're concerned on this problem. You should make sure that people who sell drugs should be shot. Why don't you find cocaine and crack and crank and all these other things here in the Soviet Union? Because the drug cartels don't feel that it's yet profitable to bring that in. As soon as they can see a profit, a way of taking money out of this country, they will start coming in in large quantities. I think the problem is going to be getting worse and drastically worse, mainly because there's going to be more availability of drugs, especially since the borders are being opened and the uh, security isn't nearly as strict as it used to be. So drugs will definitely become a very large problem soon and possibly even catch up to the U.S. Forty-eight hours will continue. I've always wanted to come to the Soviet Union all my life. My assumption has always been that they live in a police state that the police more or less have their way. Of these Kremlin walls, they are built in the 15th century. I'm just really interested to see how they relate to the community. If they don't sound like your typical American tourists... They work in assaults, shooting, stabbings, and beatings. That's because they aren't. They're cops from San Jose, California, here to take a look at Russia and the Soviet Metropolitan Police. California, USA. Well, they have another one. Like, like that. that. Oh, like that. Ah. Do you uh, yes, carry these? Yes. His is flex bars. Uh huh. Does he carry a gun? Back home in California, Rob Davis is a patrol sergeant and instructor. I don't think that they have nearly the responsibility of ensuring that someone's rights are respected as we do here. His first stop in the Soviet Union, a Moscow police academy. Uh, no, we use automatics. Automatic. Ah, oh. Like cowboy. No, like cowboy. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised and find out that they uh, do go out of their way to respect individual rights. But my feeling is that they probably don't because they don't have to. Well, With 29 years of experience behind him, Detective David Payne showed of the San Jose Police Department makes his way to the scene of a crime in a Moscow apartment building. Because of my background in the detective bureau, it's right up my alley. Detective Payne showed is astonished to find the police are not in control of the crime scene. In the U.S., what we would do first off is uh, protect the scene. But here at this crime scene, it appears to be the spectators who have the power over the police. But there are probably a couple of hundred people who seem to be entertained with what was going on. The public are not oppressed by the police. It's the other way around. 
Do you have more police power in San Jose than they have here? That's the way it seems to me. I think most of us have grown up with this attitude or this, this belief that perhaps in the Soviet Union there was a heavy-handed police state. And my experience after having ridden along with these officers last night was that that's not the case. If they saw somebody commit a crime and they could, got, could not get another citizen to act as a witness in court, they could not arrest the person. How would this kind of a system affect what you do back in San Uh We'd have a very difficult time uh, making half the cases we make. Is it now easier to be a Moscow cop with what has happened nationally with Gorbachev and how things have changed? It's harder because many people don't understand democracy correctly. They think democracy means that everything is allowed. But the law is the law. People are people. The police work here in the Soviet Union really is not that much different than the police work in the United States. How do you do? Good. <laughs> Obviously, they're a little bit behind technically, but you know, all of the good technology isn't going to do you any good if you don't have a good cop sitting in the seat. Hopefully, someday he'll be able to come and visit with us. Spasibe. Thank you. This is the 77th police precinct. <laughs> Located in a district with one of the highest crime rates in Moscow. <laughs> 100 police officers. <laughs> on call for 100,000 people. <laughs> for one week, we followed beat cops like Vasily Filionov <laughs> on tour of the seamier side of Soviet life. Do you see those hookers? He's trying to bribe the door lady to let them in. There is certainly crime in this area. But on patrol we deal mostly with petty crimes. Fights, hooligans. People aren't happy with their lives. That's why we have crime. Why, why did you stop him? This guy should be working and he's standing in line for a beer. Not only is he going to pay a fine, but his job will be notified. And if he is in line for an apartment or a vacation, he's going to go to the end of that line. I didn't have the right bus pass, so they brought me here. All Soviet citizens must carry an internal passport that restricts where they can live, a remnant of the police state. They are pigs. They're not normal. But the old fear of the police is gone. 268 policemen were killed last year in the Soviet Union versus only 70 in America. We deal with criminals every day. They have no reason to love us, and crime is definitely on the rise. In fact, crime rates here in the Kirov district, which includes the 77th precinct, have almost doubled in one year. Alexander Puzarevsky heads Kirov's Department of Criminal Investigations. Crime is rising, not because of glassness to Gorbachev's democracy, but because of the economic crisis we are in. Our economy is collapsing. That is the reason for growing crime. Our radio doesn't work. We're going to have to go in and find out what the next call is. In the 77th precinct, the police state is in a state of disrepair. You can't really call this equipment. This is a transmission to this new Moskvich. They took it apart and said they will fix it, but they never did. It's three months already. They promise and promise and they don't have the parts. Basically at night time we deal mostly with family quarrels, wife gets beat up by a husband, husband gets beat up by a wife. 99% of family fights are because of alcohol. Then there are the fights because people live in small rooms together, they divorce, you see, and have no place to go, so they still live together and fight. 
Сколько да нет, ты сам ее жрешь. It's an all too common scenario. I don't want to live with you. You know, you're the one that's impossible to live with. In a communal apartment, where there's no room for reason, a divorced couple shares half of one flat. I'm not from Moscow. So she got an extra room when she married me. Now they want to kick me out. He doesn't want a wife. He wants permission to live in Moscow. We can't solve this problem because it's caused by a shortage of apartments. They need another room. Every family is supposed to have their own apartment by the year 2000. But it'll never happen. I just know if I touch her father, I might kill him. That's why I called the police. As you can see, people here live poorly. Seven or eight people crammed into little boxes. This is what breeds discontent and crime, even murder. One just happened here yesterday in this block of flats when a wife killed her husband after drinking. Authorities say the victim was stabbed with the kitchen knife, then dragged into an elevator. The same crime scene examined by the San Jose police. The next day, the suspect is brought to the station for questioning. You've been in prison, your husband has been in prison. Are you sorry you killed your husband? Yes, I'm sorry. I have no words to describe how I feel. But he was a sadist. And what punishment do you think is awaiting you? Article 103, murder. Is there a danger here, as this crime wave, if it should get worse, it will stop the openness and the freedoms that are now growing in this society? I don't want a repeat of the terror and of what we went through in the 30s. I'm afraid of this, very afraid. <laughs> I feel like I killed myself all those years. It's a nightmare. This is a story about crime and punishment. Sergei Batinin, the accused, he started beating me, just self-defense only. The victim, Demil Gizatulin. How badly were you wounded? I, I was almost dead. And the defense lawyer, Konstantin Batmanov. The accused says he stabbed the man and that was just by accident. That will be our case today. It's a case about a love triangle, about two men, a woman and a knife. Batinin, the defendant, could get up to eight years at hard labor. There is no jury, just a judge and two private citizens. And in a Soviet court, the judge routinely asks questions. She's not so much a referee as she is an interrogator to draw out the facts. The defendant, he started beating me. What did you do, the judge asks. I took the knife. I just wanted him to leave me alone. The victim. Batinin came into the apartment. He took out a knife. He started waving it around. And he stabbed me in the stomach. The prosecutor. He should be sent away for six years. The defense lawyer. I tend to believe that Batinin came to the apartment without any intention to hurt him. But due to the circumstances, he happened to injure him. About an hour later, the verdict. Guilty. The sentence, six years at hard labor. And as he's led away, Batinin has one last thing to say. Translation, I should have killed him when I had the chance. Next stop, a Soviet labor camp. Just say the word Soviet labor camp and every American has an image. Well, this isn't it. They don't play volleyball all day, of course. Sometimes they watch TV. This is Krukova Colony, outside Moscow, a model labor camp for mostly young, mostly nonviolent offenders. Batinin, the man convicted in the stabbing, will not end up here. He says most other colonies are stricter than this one. So this is, if you have to go to prison, 
This is the place to come, huh? То есть, если надо в тюрьму, лучше здесь. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, the labor in this labor camp is making road signs. This is not the gulag, and they are not political prisoners. They are common criminals, plain and simple. What are you here for? А ты почему здесь? Попытку угона, автомобиль. Try to steal a car. He stole a car. Also, car stealing. I stole a car. I didn't know there were so many cars in Moscow. The man in charge of this camp is Colonel Nikolai Zaretsky. He showed us where the prisoners sleep, not in locked up cells, but in a dormitory. They're not an exception. You will find them everywhere in every single prison or colony. What, what is this? This is their daily ration of sugar. And what, what like he's okay, saving like, his sugar, is that it? Yes. I've got to think that there's some sugar stealing. One, you know, this guy's taking his sugar and he's taking his sugar. No, nothing like that never happened. No, nobody steals anybody's sugar? So no, there's no thieves in here. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> what, 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 what are you here for? Почему ты здесь? I committed a crime. What kind of crime? Ты что именно сделал? I took a car. <laughs> Colonel Zaretsky also took us to the mess hall, where characters from a Dickens novel would feel at home. For lunch, they get soup and black bread and a kind of porridge. In the old days, they called it gruel. How's the food over there? How's the food? In American prisons, they're always complaining about the food. I hear it's that always American prisoners are complaining. Not these guys. They never complain, right? No. Nobody complains. Colonel Zaretsky told us nothing was off limits, that we could go and see anything we wanted. We asked to see the place where he puts prisoners considered troublemakers. Zaretsky took us to the punishment cells. What are they, uh, what are they in there for? You know, just not listening, not doing what they were asked. And so they got 15 days. <coughs> 15 days in this place with no, no sunlight? What do you do all day? No, we can't do anything. We're not allowed to do anything. So you just sit or stand or sleep all day? All day. Yeah. No, we can't lay down. We just have to stand up or sit all day. What do you do when you want to sleep? Uh, speak, spot cock. Uh, this, in the evening, this goes up. So in, at night, you can see? Yeah. Let me see. This is the way they do it. That's, that's your bed? That's the way they sleep. Do you have covers? Blanket? No, nothing. We just sleep Hello? like this. Hello? Подушка? No, nothing. Life is changing by the minute in just about every corner of the Soviet Union. But not in this corner. You know, before Mikhail Gorbachev and his new Russian Revolution came to power, neither we nor the Soviet people would have heard or seen what you saw tonight on 48 Hours. And it's important to note that while the Soviet crime problem is real and deep, it's still nothing like what you could find just a few blocks from tonight's state dinner here in Washington. Something unexpected in those Washington streets earlier this evening, Mikhail Gorbachev popped out of his limousine to be seen pressing the flesh and mingling with some startled Americans. Stay tuned to this CBS station for continuing and comprehensive summit coverage, including that which will be on tonight's late local news. I'm Dan Rather, reporting tonight from Washington, and that's 48 Hours for this week.
Sunday night, Dustin Hoffman, Tyne Daly, Kevin Klein, Jessica Tandy, Lily Tomlin, and Morgan Freeman are all scheduled to join Kathleen Turner for Broadway's Biggest Night. Get ready for the 44th Annual Tony Awards, Sunday night on CBS. <laughs>